So pray for Greg. Lynn is on the road. He's, he's big, part of a big men's event down uh, south uh, near the Texas-Mexico border. Uh, he's down there right now. So uh, I'm soloing it today, uh, except for Damien's here with help me out. And that's, uh, that's really good to have, uh, have you guys here. Next week, I'm going to start my identity series. Uh, in fact, I'm calling it Getting Your Mind Right. Get Your Mind Right. And so hopefully you can be here for that. Uh, a week from Monday, the 28th of February, Show Me the Father. We're going to have a reshowing of that movie. And uh, I know a number of you are coming. You're bringing your kids. You're bringing your dad. You're bringing your siblings. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful movie, uh, the 28th. Reminder, 5.30 is the food, Chick-fil-A food, free, uh, 6 o'clock movie, and then at 7.30, Damien's going to share his testimony. So it's going to be a great, great night, February 28th, and that's at First Baptist Blue Springs. And if you don't know where that is, it's the big church that sits on the hill just south of I-70 and south of Independence Center. So it used to be called Tri-City. used to be Tri-City. That's where, that's where First Baptist... First Baptist Blue Springs is in Independence, in case you didn't know that. So that's what I'm trying to tell you. All right. Uh, let me think here. The week after that, Damien's speaking. Uh, hey, Damien, we ought to tell these guys, Damien and I are doing something really cool. We will not be here on March 16th, the two of us. We are speaking at the 60th annual Kansas Governor's Prayer Breakfast out in Topeka, and, uh, you know, this number 60 uh, for their event, they've had in prior years, uh, uh, Gerald Ford has spoken at it, Ben Carson has spoken at it, uh, Dan Mears has spoken at it, and they're first time ever going to have a, a tandem speaking uh, thing, and so we will not be here on March 16th, but pray, pray, pray for us, even right now, because that's going to be a neat opportunity to be in front of uh, their legislature, legislative uh, people, the senators, the congressmen, the governor, the whole bit over in the state of Kansas. So very, very special. Scott Singer, you have how many books? Oh, I've got probably uh, 10 left. I'm buying another page here. Okay. So some, someone last week said, I didn't get a book from Scott Singer. I can't remember who it was. He's right there. Right here. Right here. So anyway, see Scott for 10 bucks or zero, depending upon your need. Your need. There you go. All right. Scott, thanks for bringing those for us. One word, books. Okay. Let's pray it up, man. Let's pray it up. It's going to be a great day. Lord, thanks for this morning. Thank you for the chance to gather. So, so good to be at the Brothers. And I pray, Lord, today that you will uh, speak through heaven right to our hearts Bring us, the, we pray for the truth to be delivered and, and the truth to be proclaimed. Uh, and thank you for this uh, wonderful chance to be together. Pray us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Evan Lang, bring, bring it on up here, Evan. You're going to use the mic, I hear. Use the mic. Hey, Zoom guys, thanks for being here too. And we love having you here. Stay afterwards. Mike and he's going to do a little Q&A on the back end. And that should be a blessing as well. Do I need to turn this one off, Chris? Yes. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, guys. Well, just leave it up here. All right, guys. Uh, you know, I've, I've spoken enough at TGIW now that you guys probably like rolling your eyes and going, he's going to ask me to give stuff away again. Oh, no. Here's the guy that talks about generosity and talks about giving and why we should give. But hey, I, you know, at least I didn't do this before Valentine's Day, because if I was like Valentine's Day, I'd be really prodding you to make sure that you got something really nice for your wife and everything else. If you didn't, it's only February 16th. So go buy her something really nice. Like right now, maybe you can make up some brownie points or something. But today, the, the message is called the generosity of Jesus. And, uh, and Rod was kind of teasing me uh, yesterday because... Uh, I had thought up the title and I was like, man, this is, I'm, I really want to look into this. And it was like months ago. And then yeah, I go, oh man, I got to really figure out what I'm talking about here. And, uh, and so it's really got me to, to figure out a lot about, hey, what, what was Jesus like here on earth? And the first kind of questions I want you to, to pose to yourself is who's the most generous person that you know? And that can be somebody that you don't know personally, but maybe it's somebody you've heard of, like a Warren Buffett or a Bill Gates, somebody that's given tremendous amounts or something. And the secondary question off of that is, why are they the most generous person to you? 
you know, a lot of the times we think about maybe just, do they just give a bunch of money away or maybe it's their lifestyle, but think about that question. Who's the most generous person that you know? The second question off of that, that is, there's a difference between giving and generosity. And what I mean here is when you give, people are prompted to give for some reason. Like I'm prompted, I see a need and I want to give to, towards it to help fix a need. Or hey, I'm really inspired by something, so I want to give towards it. That's giving. And giving is good. There's lots of Bible passages on giving and why it is good. But what we're going to talk about more today is generosity. And the difference between generosity is that you are a generous person. It's who you are. So not all givers are generous, but every person that is generous is a giver. It's just who they are. It's in their DNA. And you probably have known some of these people. These people are the most fun to be around. Uh, these are the people that you go out to lunch and they've already paid for the bill. Like they are like they're on top of it. They get excited to give any opportunity to give. And when I was answering the first question for myself, who's the most generous person that I know? Jesus wasn't the person I thought about. But guess what, guys? Jesus was the most generous person to ever walk the face of the earth. He was. How do we know that? Uh, the scripture we're going to talk about today is actually a scripture I used last time, too, but I'm still working through it myself. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And this says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. There's a lot of stuff in that, that passage. We can talk about it for a long time, but let's just highlight a couple things. Jesus was rich. Do you guys agree with that? It says in the Bible that all the gold, all the silver is his. Everything in heaven and earth belongs to Jesus. That's a little bit of an understatement almost by Paul. Like Jesus was rich. Like he was rich. Like he was the most, he's the, like it's impossible to think about. He owns everything. But then it becomes even absurd what is said next. That though he was get rich for your sake, for you guys, he became poor through his poverty, that we might become rich. If that's not generosity, I don't know what is. <laughs> the richest person to ever walk the face of the earth decided to be in poverty so that you all can be rich someday. Uh, John Piper talks about this whole, and this is a large theological point that a lawyer is not going to be able to do justice towards, but Basically, Jesus, obviously 100% deity, 100% God, even when he was here on earth, but 100% man. And basically, he never left his deity, but he basically was like walking down steps. And he walked down among us and came into the, to the mire and the muck that is uh, the sin in this world so that he could dwell among us. So let's talk about Jesus's life here on earth and maybe some of the generosity components from it. And uh, this one is a little bit tough. And so sometimes you can look at something to, to, uh, to identify it by looking at the opposites. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to see, we're, how do we know that Jesus is, is generous? We're going to look at the opposites. So the first uh, point I have here is that Jesus was not stingy. Stingy is your first fill-in. So what's the definition of stingy? Stingy is unwilling to give or spend. One, one definition just says ungenerous. <laughs> ungenerous is stingy. So let's look at a couple of, of things of, to see if Jesus was stingy or not. And the first thing we're going to look at is, is possessions, uh, the possessions that Jesus has. And, and guys, most of the time when we think about generosity, this is where we go to. 
are you generous with your possessions? Are you generous with your stuff? This is going to be a very small point <laughs> in this talk. So first off, what we see is that Jesus, in his ministry, in public ministry, he didn't even have a house. He gave that up so that he could do his public ministry. It says in Matthew 8, 20, that foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Which, that's pretty generous. He gave up, he, he had a career. We know that Jesus was a carpenter trained by his dad, but he gave up that career so that he, and even a house so that he could serve and be generous. But the second point is the one that really kind of prompted this message for me. There is no account in the gospel that Jesus ever gave any money away. There is no point in the gospel. Now, you, there's parts where he paid taxes, paid taxes even before him and Peter, but he didn't give. That was required. There's no place in the, in the gospels that Jesus gave money away which is kind of crazy because when we think of generosity, we think about giving money away. But the most generous person to walk the face of the earth didn't. Now, he probably didn't have any money, <laughs> frankly. We know that the ministry had money because Judas held the money box for the disciples. Um, but there's no account that they actually gave money to the poor people that they saw. Jesus healed them instead, took away their sins. I didn't say that, hey, and then he gave them, you know, a couple of denarii to go and have their livelihood. That one struck me pretty hard. And actually, when I was looking through the Gospels, I could only find one thing that Jesus possessed that he actually gave away. And what he gave away were his clothes and his tunic that he wore. So if you remember, when Jesus was crucified on the cross... Um, for, first off, Jesus, they didn't take Jesus's life. Jesus gave his life. At any point, <laughs> he said he could, have, he could have called on the Father and sent an army of angels to take him down, to stop what was occurring, but he didn't. So he gave his life. And so therefore, I'm inferring that he also gave his clothes. So the Romans, after they were crucifying Jesus, remember, they cast lots for his clothes and his tunic which is prophesied by, which, guys, when you think about that, what an act of generosity even in there. The people that are literally killing him, he gave something to them. Like, and, and you know, the Bible, when you read the Bible, it's one, it's one book. <laughs> the message is throughout. Think of back, to, go back to Genesis to the first sin. So God creates these two people, and these two people immediately mess up in sin and do the one thing they told him not to. And God, in his generosity, kills an animal, makes skins, and gives them clothes. All the way from Genesis to the time Jesus is crucified, God gives us clothes because he loves us. That's how generous God is. And it hit me like a ton of bricks <laughs> to go, that's, a, that's amazing that you can see from, from all the way from the beginning of the time throughout Jesus's ministry. But really, I think when you see Jesus's ministry, the thing that he was really, really generous with, too, was his time. And fellas, this one's hard, especially in our society today. This is one of the hardest ones that we are supposed to not be stingy with. Guys, we're stingy with our time. I don't have time for that. I don't have time to do this. I, I got to go do this and this and this. And we're busy. We're hurried. And this life has a lot of distractions and different things that we have that are going on. So, but Jesus, Jesus was unhurried. That's your second fill-in. Unhurried. Throughout Jesus's public ministry, he wasn't hurried at all. Um, Jesus, as you see him, he is walking with his disciples place to place. And, um, man, like if I was a disciple, like I would be like the doofus disciple, I think, because 
like all the other disciples, like they question that Jesus teaches them this great point. And then like the next sentence later, they're off doing something else. But Jesus continued just to walk with them, to teach them, to disciple them. But you can even see this as Jesus, as a young child. Remember when Jesus was a child and uh, Mary and Joseph go to the temple in Jerusalem and then they're heading back home and they realize after two days, hey, where's Jesus at? (laughs) Well, Jesus was still back at the temple. He was still having conversations with the teachers. Um, So even as a child, and I have young children, uh, David, you got, you got young children. They're running around all over the place. Jesus, even as a child was unhurried. (laughs) He would, he sat down and talked with his elders, which by the way, guys, I will say this every time I've spoken at TGIW, I am always so intimidated because I look out amongst you guys and I say, there is more wisdom in one of your pinkies than I could ever have. (laughs) So I don't, there's not a whole lot I can teach or say other than just point right to the Bible. And most of the time when I talk about these messages about generosity, I'm pointing right at myself because this is one I struggle with. I I am stingy with my time. I'm hurried. I'm looking at all the things I have to do to get done. And in real, in reality, I think what Jesus wants us to do is to not be hurried. Just take time, spend with people, spend with, with, with people that are going to be in eternity one day to share life with them. Um, you know, Jesus also, not only did, was he unhurried in his time with, the, with his disciples and with people, but also with his heavenly father. So, so think about all the times that Jesus would do a miracle and then he would retreat and he would go off into the wilderness or go off into a, a garden and pray. And he would pray earnestly or pray all night. And guys, this is another time that if I can pray for five minutes in the morning, I feel like, all right, I had a good prayer session. I, you know, when's the last time we stopped and we were able to pray for an hour, for two hours? Um, there was, uh, if y'all remember, I believe it was Martin Luther. Uh, so during the Reformation, Martin Luther obviously grid all these great things. And Martin Luther has a very busy calendar and he was starting to get really busy. And Martin Luther said, you know what? I need to change something. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wake up two hours before my first meeting and my first appointment, and I'm going to pray for two hours. And he said, except for the days that I'm really, really busy, I, except for the days that I'm really, really busy. And on those days, I'm going to wake up four hours early to pray. <laughs> Guys, the first thing that we do is cut that out. We cut, well, I, I don't have time for that. I got to go do the things, things. Jesus knew the importance (laughs) to not be stingy with his prayer time. Guys, I'm talking to myself on this. There might as well just be a mirror right here. (laughs) Because this is is something that I struggle with, that we need to do, and we need to follow after Jesus' model. Um, I quoted a a quote by Dallas Willard yesterday, and uh, John Mark Comer, who's a pastor out of Portland, wrote a book about just this one quote. And uh, Dallas Willard, great pastor, theologian out of California. And uh, in Dallas Willard, there was a pastor one time that came to him who was busy and doing all the things. And he was looking to Dallas Willard to have his like, hey, answer these questions. Help me out. What's your advice? What should you give this young pastor? And Dallas Willard gave him one line. He said, you need to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. (laughs) And you know what? You can't ruthlessly eliminate something from your life just by like brushing it off or say, oh, I'll do that every once in a while. Like that's a daily thing to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Jesus did such a good job with that. He was not stingy with his time. Another thing that Jesus wasn't stingy with uh, were his miracles. Uh, So, just I, I just wrote down a few miracles, like 
water, like this first miracle, water to wine, which Rod, go back and listen to Rod's miracle study. Just amazing. You can hear it go into great detail on all these. But like when Jesus was at the wedding feast and they ran out of wine and his mother looked at him and said, hey, what are we going to do? Jesus says, okay, you know, this is internal dialogue. Let's go make some more wine. Uh, and, and he turns the water into wine. That's great. But look at the, like the abundance generosity here. He filled up six stone water pots that were 20 to 30 gallons each. Like, that's a ton of wine. Like, like that, like, like what kind of party was this? Like, like seriously, like that is, I just like, why, did, like that was, it's ridiculously, like he went above and beyond. Look at the, look at the other, like the feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus feeds these 5,000 people. He knew every one of those 5,000 men, and obviously there were women and children. So he knew all of their needs. He knew exactly how hungry each person was. He could have made just the right amount of food to fill them up. Nope. Jesus, they, let, they had 12 basketfuls of leftovers. At the 4,000, they had seven basketfuls of leftovers. Like, think about kind of like, I, I call this extravagant generosity. Jesus doesn't meet our need. He goes above and beyond that. You have leftovers. You got leftover wine. You got leftover food because he was just so above and beyond. Gosh, that just strikes me how generous Jesus is. It's extravagant generosity. He wasn't stingy at all. All right, let's go to our point two. And this one is a is confession moment here too. This one's a really tough one. It's a tough one for guys, especially, I think. Jesus was a good receiver. He was a good receiver. And fellas, a gift is not a gift unless it is received. If I gave my wife a present on Valentine's Day and she said, thank you, and just left it there, walked away, never opened it. Did I really give her anything? <laughs> no. A gift has to be received. And, and this one, we struggle so much with it as guys, and not just gifts, not just material possessions. How about gifts of compliments? When somebody gives you a compliment, hey, good job on this. Good job on this. Are we first to say, oh, no, you don't need to say, you don't need to say that. Or do we receive that? How about... How about gifts of service? Uh, when, somebody, when somebody comes over and says, hey, let me help you with this. <laughs> uh, do guys, do we struggle with this at all? Uh, hey, uh, Jeff Botts here, and uh, Jeff has a great men's group as well. The first men's group I went to, I drove in, and my car is just like all the lights are going off in my car and everything else. And, you know, like most guys, I'm not going to say anything. Like, I can fix this. You know, I can fix my car. No, I swallowed my pride, went into this men's group and said, hey, guys, I know nothing about cars, but there's sparks flying out my hood and I need some help. Like, help me out. It's hard. It's hard to, to, say, to ask and receive gifts from people. Jesus was excellent at receiving gifts. Look in uh, Matthew 26, 6 through 13. And again, this is uh, actually, again, in John 12, 1 through 8. And this is when Jesus was anointed with expensive perfume and oil. Um, you know, the disciples, whenever Mary is, is anointing Jesus with oil, they said that it was a year's wages. Basically, 11 months worth of wages was how much this oil was expensive for. And they're like, we could have given that to the poor. We could have done so many good things. And Jesus says, no, what she's doing is a good thing. He receives that gift. I don't know if I would have been able to. I think I would have been thinking, oh, this is too extravagant. How do I receive this? But guys, like, think about this from a generosity perspective. And I know football season just got done, but like Patrick Mahomes, if Patrick Mahomes is the best quarterback ever, but nobody ever catches the ball, is he a good quarterback? He'd have a zero completion percentage. He'd have zero yards, zero touchdowns. Like, I guess you'd have zero interceptions, but like he would at zero, 
he wouldn't he wouldn't be a good quarterback at all. He'd say that's a worthless quarterback. You got to have both. You got to be a receiver of gifts and be able to do so humbly. And I think really for guys, why this is hard is because we're prideful. It's because we want to say, hey, we can do this on our own. I got this. I don't need your gift. I don't need your help. Which, fellas, listen to that for a second. I don't need your help. I don't need what you're giving me. That is the anti-gospel. That's opposite of the gospel. The gospel says you cannot do this on your own. <laughs> you need this gift of God's grace. You cannot earn it by yourself. And so in order to be, in my mind, in order to actually be generous, we have to receive God's gift first. We have to be a good receiver of gifts in order to actually be generous. And that's a tough, tough thing to do. Why do we give? Why are we generous? Because he first gave to us. First gave to us. All right, let's move on to our third final point. Jesus was not a taker. <laughs> he wasn't selfish. That's your fill in there. He wasn't selfish. Now, this one might seem like a, yeah, of course Jesus wasn't selfish, but like, let's, let's talk about it a little bit more. Like I, I have, I've got little kids and I, I coach my, uh, my sons. I got a seven-year-old and a five-year-old boys and a three-year-old little girl. And I coach my boys in basketball. So you have like 10, seven-year-olds running around. You got nine, five-year-olds running around. And we'll gather up in a huddle at the end of the games and, and they get snack time. And you know what happens when you have a big bag of snacks with a bunch of five-year-olds all around? Craig knows this. Like, like, they're all like, they just line up and say, oh, thank you. No, they're grabbing in there. They're ripping stuff. They're taking everything they can get. Like, they just want it. They're just taking, taking, taking. How often do you think Jesus was sitting down at the supper table with the disciples and he was the one just grabbing everything? No, he didn't do that at all. He was selfish. Jesus's ministry constantly was pointing back to other people, giving to other people, letting people go first, living humbly. What did Jesus take from people here on earth? Nothing. <laughs> Jesus didn't take anything. And I know we just talked about Jesus received. He did. He received gifts from people, but he didn't take gifts from people. He didn't take stuff from people. He wasn't selfish. And when we, and the example that I have, if you have a, if you have a Bible, uh, actual Bible in front of you, and if you have Google, I guess you can do this with Google, but if you go back to the maps section in your Bible, Guys, you got to look at the maps in your Bible. It's the very end. It's awesome. What's in the map section? So if you're in the map section, I'm going to try to hold this up. Uh, and maybe you can see it. So if you look at, go to the map section and go to the time of Jesus' ministry. And go to where it looks at Israel. And you're going to see a map of Israel. You're going to see there's the Sea of Galilee. Lots of passages about the Sea of Galilee. And then you're going to see down here, there's the Dead Sea. And there's a river that flows into the Sea of Galilee, and it flows out of the Sea of Galilee into the Dead Sea. That river is called the Jordan River. You've heard of the Jordan River. This is where Jesus got baptized. There's a lot of things about the Jordan River. So what's really cool about this picture, and again, how God even works, like he gave us this picture and geography, how this river flows into the Sea of Galilee, and then it flows out of the Sea of Galilee, and the Sea of Galilee is full of life. So think about all the, the uh, fish, you know, Peter's fishing, all the fish that are in the Sea of Galilee, in and around the Sea of Galilee is lush, it's green, there's things that are growing, there's life there. And when water flows out of the Sea of Galilee, it goes down into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, nothing flows out of the Dead Sea. It just sits there. And guess what? There is no life in the Dead Sea. <laughs> it's dead. There's no fish that can be there. There's no life around it. It's just a barren wasteland. There's nothing there because it's just salty. That is such a picture of generosity in our lives. 
when we receive things and we give it out, we give, we get life and we give life. But when we are selfish and we just take, we might think that we're building up bigger things for ourselves, but actually what we're building up is death. Nothing is growing. Nothing is surviving in that. We rob somebody of a blessing whenever we're a bad receiver. We are. That's, a, that's another thing. We're robbing them of generosity when we're a bad receiver. And again, this picture, again, I love it in geography. I mean, it's like the Sea of Galilee might be a really good receiver, but it's, a ter- it's terrible at generosity because it doesn't actually give anything out. It just takes, it just takes, it just takes. I have a correction in my notes here, by the way. Um, and it is an intentional correction. You know what Jesus did take? Jesus took all sin. All sin. You couldn't do it on your own. (laughs) You couldn't say, Jesus, here's my sin. We can repent. We can confess our sin. But Jesus takes your sin. Um, John 1, 29. This is John the Baptist. This is one of the first times that he sees Jesus coming Uh, to the Jordan River to be baptized. You know what John the Baptist says? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away our sins. He takes away our sins. It's the only thing that Jesus took because he had to. We couldn't do it on our own. We also know that Jesus, um, when he takes away our sin, he takes away our burdens. The the yoke that we carry. He says, take my yoke upon you because my burden is light. We, he takes these burdens away from us. But we have to accept it. Romans 6.23, we've all heard this. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. We have to accept his free gift in order for him to take away your sin. All right, so what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to follow after Jesus' model of being a generous person? Well, we have to be a generous person. And that's not necessarily with money. Because guys, Jesus didn't give any money away. (laughs) So let's get it out of our mindset that says, hey, in order for me to be generous, I just need to give more money away. That's That's what Evan talked about today. It's not at all what I'm talking about today. Not at all. You need to be generous with your time. You need to be generous with your relationship. You need to be intention- and, and generous with your intention, your t- intentionality with other people, intentionality with your prayer life to the Father. This is a way of life. And guess what? When you do those things, you're probably going to be more generous with your money too. <laughs> Uh, Rick Warren, uh, I think I said this last time, but it's a great quote. Rick Warren says that you can give without loving. So you can give to something without loving, but you cannot love without giving. If you love something, you're going to give to it. You're going to give to it because you love that person. You love that thing. Fellas, we're all the recipients of the greatest charitable act in all of history. (laughs) We've all received God's grace. For yet he was rich, came poor on our sake, so on our behalf, so that by his poverty we might become rich. We are the we have received the greatest gift ever. We have to let it flow. We cannot hold this in by ourselves. This is why the great commandment is there. Don't just hold this great gift in. Let it flow. Go and make disciples. Go and baptize them. We have to go and share the great gift that God's given us. There's a ton of verses, and I I have a link down here in the resources. of There's 2,350 verses on money and possessions and generosity in the Bible. There's great ones like sowing and reaping in 2 Corinthians 9-11. There's there's great verses like in Luke 12, 48, where much is given, much is, ex- is expected. And there's awesome ber- great Proverbs. Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 is a great one. 
basically it says it's good to give and guess what when you give you're blessed <laughs> like it's just that is a promise if you give you're going to feel blessing you're going to get blessing and that's not prosperity gospel that's not saying hey i give so that i get that just says guess what when you give you get blessing it's a promise you do um i'm gonna end on this uh when you think about heaven when we get to heaven, you read in Revelation how there will be no tears in heaven. There'll no tears from your eyes. Everybody is going to be joyful in heaven. It's going to be an awesome place. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. But you know what? There's going to be one person in heaven who is the most joyful, the most joyful in heaven, and that's Jesus Christ. And do you know why he's going to be the most joyful, I think? It's because he gave the most while he was here on earth. He gave everything for you and me. And if we are Christians and called to follow after his example, guys, let's don't hold back. We're here on this earth for a vapor. Let's give generously and live generous lives so that we can experience his joy, not just here on earth, but in heaven as well. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for these guys. Thank you for the people online. Um, you are so good. You are so generous. You are so gracious with us, Father. And we just love you so much. Just pray, Lord, that um, as you fill us up, I pray that we pour ourselves out on all those that we're around. Let them feel your generosity and your joy in all the acts that we do. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.